Well, 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 I think that we are seeing firm evidence right here, right now, of an all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, benevolent deity. It must be true, because here it is on the very first attempt at logging into the internet and doing my live stream right off the bat without any nonsense, any falderall, any kerfufflery, any hassles, any hang-ups, any technical issues, straight off the bat, I'm able to come on here and bring you this week's episode live of Tent Talks Tunes. Coming at you just like that. Better than 3D, kids, because this is a real-life human being with personality plus doing the thing that I do every single Wednesday, 7 p.m., right here on the Internet. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Put that in your cigarette holder and smoke it. Let me reach over here very quickly to click on certain buttons on my sit-down computer which will give me tangible evidence that I am actually alive. Well, it looks like I am. Hey, check it out. Alan Versapellis is with us. Mr. Bob Eaton, representing the great town of Brookfield, Connecticut, is here. My old boss, Chuck Kessler, might or might not be tuned in right now from Danbury lately, wherever you are now, Chuck. Hello. Sean Mosher from the very far expanses of Northern Connecticut. Everybody's tuned in and getting ready to rock here on Tent Talks Tunes. Woo-wee! Definitely good to be back. I know I was on the air last week, but um, without my even knowing it, I think I was operating at about 75% capacity. As I'm sure you heard me talk about, I... Just got off the road with U.S. black metal originators Profanatica. We did a solid three-week tour of the eastern part of the USA and Canada, and it was more fun than should be legal. It was a blast and a half. But unbeknownst to me, the effects of not getting a good night's sleep for a solid three weeks, whoo, that definitely caught up with me and bit me on the butt. I hate to admit it, but as I get older and older and older and older and older, every second of every day I keep getting older. I hate to admit it, but um, sleep is important, and you got to budget time for sleep. And truthfully, it always was important. But back in my younger, dumber days, I certainly I just paid no mind to it. I could rock and roll all night and party every day and wake up after not enough sleep get a, a great breakfast of Dr. Pepper and chocolate chip cookies and go open the front door to Trash American Style and do a 10 or 11 hour day and then repeat the process. That, my friends, is not a good model for living a healthy lifestyle. And I was able to fake it for quite a while. But now that I'm here and I'm just sort of creaking around, you know, shuffling around my little cabin in the woods here, and hitting the rock and roll stage when the opportunity presents itself, I gotta admit, you got to sleep. Oi, you got to sleep sometimes. And um, even though we were we were definitely traveling in style with Profanatica, we had the tour van, we had a road manager, we had a full-time merch girl, the road manager did all the driving. So, you know. It wasn't like a, a hard slog of endless toil. The thing that got me was the fact that we were staying in hotels every night. And, you know, when you're in a hotel, there is the ever so dreadful 11 a.m. checkout time. That's a universal standard. And that is pretty much etched in stone, especially when you're on the road and you have to be in the next town at the venue at a certain time to do load in and sound check and all that. These are just completely set in stone rules. So the people at the venue in the next town don't care how late you got out of the previous night's gig or whether or not you had to do a couple of hours driving after the gig 
or what the checkout time was. You have to be there ready to go, Johnny on the spot to set up and sound check. So yeah, you could get in at any time at night and get a few hours of sleep, maybe even a good night's sleep kind of, but the alarm's going to go off in time for you to get out and be in the van at 11 o'clock. So it was three solid weeks of getting varying amounts of sleep every night, usually not enough, having to wake up at 11 or before actually, get out to the van and hit the road to the next town. And it's, you know, we're in the van, so it's possible to nap and doze and try to catch up, but it does not replace a good, solid, uninterrupted night's sleep. And so doing that pattern for three weeks and then uh, jumping right back into my normal routine of being a TPOS label mogul who spends a lot of time actively promoting his releases to sell them on Discogs, eBay, and Bandcamp, or maybe let's say Discogs, eBay, and Bandcamp, that's a hint, guys. You know, to get right back into the swim of things, fully expecting to be fully recovered, no go, does not work, no can do. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I lasted about five days with that model before the body said, you know what? You're not Superman. You need to sleep. And guess what? You're going to sleep right now. And well, that happened. The nap reflex took over and boom, it was time to start catching up after those solid three weeks of not sleeping. So it took about three days. Yesterday was maybe the first day where I felt fully 100% back on the beam. So that's the long way of saying that this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes should be sharper, snappier, livelier, yay, peppier than maybe last week's was. I thought last week's was pretty good. I had a good time talking to everybody and opening the mail and sharing some tour stories and tour swag and all that. And that was fun. But yeah, I feel good. I got my Danbury tap water in a custom labeled jug by TPOS recording artist Chrissy Pissy. Or is that Pissy Chrissy? Maybe I'm not as awake as I thought I was. Yes, that's Pissy Chrissy's handiwork. She is willing to let the world know that I'm hoisting a jug of Danbury tap. Thank you, Pissy Chrissy. If you haven't gotten her fine, yet at the same time, course CD on TPOS, this is my invitation to you to do so. Let me reach over here so you guys can get a nice close-up of my unshaven face and my very high forehead. Pissy Chrissy on TPOS, number 258. Limited edition of 30, each one numbered by the pissy one herself. She wrote all the, she wrote all of the lyrics. I wrote most of the music. I love this album. Love it, love it, love it. Pissed off punk poetry at its finest, and I'll say it again, not only finest, but coarsest. Pissy Chrissy. She's mad, she's angry, doesn't mean you have to be. You could be one happy guy or gal listening to Pissy Chrissy out now on TPOS. Let's see, we have got some... Uh, comments. Oh, people are popping for the eight tracks. So oh, yes, James Pogo from the Arm Delight Rifle says that they used to have an eight track museum in upstate New York and they had metal machine music on eight track. You know, James, you're the second guy today I've spoken to to mention the coveted and cherished eight track cartridge of Lou Reed's metal machine music. My pal Mark Robinson out in Ohio, who's got the excellent label Punk Media and who is currently doing a really cool YouTube video series on his works with Tiny Tim and Gigi Allen and probably other artists that he hasn't talked about yet. Mark's got this really cool YouTube channel telling excellent stories, and I consider Mark to be a friend and someone who I have a, had a lot of fun working with to release Tiny Tim and Gigi Allen music via his label. He has a copy of Metal Machine Music on 8-track. And I let him know. I let him know that I am covetous, envious, and jealous of him for possessing an 8-track cartridge 
of what is, I'm not joking, kids, my favorite Lou Reed album. I say that without irony. I say that without humor. I love Metal Machine Music by 8-Track, but on 8-Track or LP or whatever by Lou Reed. I honestly don't like Lou Reed's solo stuff by and large. I love the Velvet Underground. Giant mark for the Velvet Underground. I love the stuff he did as a Pickwick songwriter in the early 60s before he was in the Velvets. His solo work I can take or leave, but Metal Machine Music... Utterly brilliant, totally genius work of noise, ambient, soundscape, whatever you want to call it. And to have it on one of my favorite formats, 8-track, man, what a star in the crown that would be. So yes, James Pogo, I'm with you. Drool at the thought of owning Metal Machine Music on 8-track. I know there's one out there with my name. Maybe one out there with your name, too. All we got to do is keep our eyes open. And I'll drink to that. <clears throat> Let's check the bulletin board, shall we? We've got some exciting events coming up here. Besides my usual hype, shill, and shameless plug for my fabulous label, TPOS, which, did I mention, has a fine array of stuff for sale on Discogs, eBay, and Bandcamp? Not just TPOS stuff, but incredible used and collectible records, tapes, CDs, and VHS tapes as well. Well, I'm telling you now, I got a lot of stuff and it's all for sale. That's how I support myself. That's how I feed Harry the cat. That's how I keep the boat afloat by offering you, the people, quality goods at hot, hot prices. Not only on my label, but on other labels throughout the ages. So check me out, baby, on Discogs, eBay, and Bandcamp. I don't promote any product unless I believe in it. I believe in my product. Bet your sweet bippy on that one. Mm -mm -mm. Sean Mosher says he might have one in his collection, a uh, Lou Reed Metal Machine music. Well, Sean, if you do, <clears throat> don't forget I'm your pal, and this is my mailing address. Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut. 06470. And that is a great segue to check the mailbox. I know I said bulletin board. We'll check the mailbox right now since that segue was so seamless. I just have to take advantage of it. So yeah, what's come in the mail in these past seven days or so? Well, here's a great big package, which comes to me in a plain brown wrapper. Could be sinister. Could be fun. Let's tear this sucker apart and open it. Let's see what it is. Let's see what it's made of. Let's see what we I'm ripping it to shreds. I'm like a Blondie song here. Oh boy, it's all that's all about to happen. The truth is going to be revealed. Yes. What we have here is a short stack of Outsider magazine. Yay! The latest issue of Hudson Valley's finest punk rock print magazine. It is Outsider. I am always happy to contribute to Outsider. I've got an article in this new issue. I have forgotten what article I wrote for this new issue because I write so much. I've written about uh, the time I videotaped Nirvana. I have written about uh, my various adventures on tour as a punk rocker. I've written about running a store, Trash American style. Oh, check it out. Here's an article about Connecticut punk rock legends, The Pissed. They get my vote for being the single best punk slash hardcore band that Connecticut ever produced. That's my opinion. Big, fun, big fan of 76% Uncertain too from the old school. Ah, here it is. <laughs> Look at that. A full page article on, as you guys know, one of my very favorite topics ever, Discharge and the Grave New World Era. Oh, man. Look at that. One solid page in Outsider Magazine. Ha ha ha. This is a free magazine. I'll be very happy to send a copy to anybody who wants one and is willing to send me uh, some dollars for postage. Or if you order anything off of me, either directly or via Discogs, eBay, and Bandcamp, I will be very happy to enclose a free issue of Outsider Magazine. Because you wanted the best, you're going to get the best. I should also mention... <clears throat> and this is another segue as we go all the way from hither and yon, that I will most likely be having issues of Outsider Magazine at the upcoming 
Danbury Record and CD Expo. Yes, it's the record show that I promote here in Danbury at VFW Hall number 149 in downtown. We got a room full of awesome dealers selling new, used, rare, collectible, cheap, affordable, all kinds of records, tapes, CDs. I will be set up. I will have three tables of the aforementioned records, tapes, CDs, and stuff. Danbury Record CD Expo, May 4th. Outsider Magazine, for free, will be there as well. Thank you, Holly, the publisher of Outsider, for having me in the magazine and sending me that big old stack for me to give to you, the discerning, educated reader. <clears throat> what else have we got in the mail? Oh, I love opening mail. Here's something. I was going to open this up uh, last week, but um, I decided to spread the mail out over a period of time. We all know what this means. Not only is it addressed to me, Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470, but the return address is from none other than Mr. Gary Forney in LaPorte City, Iowa. We all know Gary outsider artist, a man who uses the song poem genre as well as his own singing and playing with his band Punkin and the Iowa Mountain Tour. He uses song poems to express himself to great effect. Awesome stuff. Very happy to have released not one, but two albums by him last month. I think I might have one here on cassette just to show you guys. It's called An Ordinary Life. It's a mix of song, poem, stuff, and original performances. It is sublime to the max. And last week I unveiled a brand new, at least to my ears, full-length CD of song, poem, stuff that Gary sent me for release on TPOS. That'll be happening this year, I think. Here's another package, and it sure feels like there's a CD in there. Let's see if I can get this thing open. Let me reach over here to the, uh, the thousand mile box cutter. We will carefully slice this thing open so as to reveal the contents. This is a cold reveal here on Tent Talks Tunes. If you guys are watching on my YouTube channel, wherever it is, my YouTube channel, you could pretend this is live and get the same kind of thrill that we're all getting. Because, let's face it, if you're watching it on the YouTube channel, you most likely have not seen it elsewhere. So, it's better than Memorex. Almost as good as live. More blade. Let's slice this thing open very carefully so as not to damage either the contents or myself. It is not my goal to end up being on one of those ha 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 look at this guy slicing his finger off live videos that would undoubtedly go viral should, were I to do so. I don't want to end up like that. So I'm going to very carefully slice this thing open and then rip it open using brute force. Not brute force, the guy who recorded Confections of Love, but brute force is raw power. And oh, here we go, a stack of CDs. Well, all by Gary Forney, I'm going to bet you. What are these? Well, ah, Iowa Mountain Tour, live in the year 2000. Ooh, here we go. The Best of Magic Key, 1998. Magic Key is the principal song poem outlet that Gary has used for his song poem stuff. Here's a compilation of theirs, and I'm going to guess that Gary's on here somewhere, along with some other stuff that'll be very, very interesting. I'm a huge fan of the song poem art form. I've got a couple of song poem compilations coming out one of these days on TPOS of all vintage song poem music I've found out in the wild. Here's another one, Songwriters International. Yes. And here's one that I can't make out the name, because even though I've got my glasses, it's not very well lit in here. My assumption is that Gary is on all of these. I can't wait to hear what he's got on them, plus the other artists, because you find some really cool stuff like this. More Gary Forney. This is a treasure trove of Gary Forney stuff that I did not even know existed. 
Bathroom of the Right. That's what I call an intriguing song title. And the aforementioned Iowa Mountain Tour live in 2000. Man, Gary, thank you so much. I think this is going to lead to some exciting developments on TPOS because uh, to completely rip off the old ESP record label, the artist alone determines what they will hear and what they will present on a TPOS release. And that's why I only work with artists who I believe in and who I support. So Gary Forney, a real feather in the cap to have him on TPOS in the past, the present and the future. I'll drink some Danbury tap to that. <clears throat> in the, uh, let's see, what else do we get in the mail? We got a postcard from my former employee, Tommy P. This actually goes back a few months. This kind of uh, fell behind the uh, desk, but he was on a bicycle tour of the entire state of Florida. And here he sent me a real postcard, a real written postcard. I love this with real handwriting on it. Very cool. Thank you, Tom. Gary Forney just chimed in and said, quote, I have a master plan, unquote. Good. I'm glad to be a part of your machine. A cog in your works, Gary Forney. This next item I'm going to unveil is not mail, but this is a mysterious black bag I got from my pal Chris Iconicide. Note the Iconicide t-shirt. I already knew what this was because it fell out of the bag. So I figured no sense in being coy about it. I might as well spot a fabulous Iconicide t-shirt. Um, ran into Chris. Got, actually got to meet Chris for the first time in person ever at the final Profanatica tour date in Brooklyn, New York, which was an awesome show, man. We played to about 200 people. They were going off. And Chris showed up. Very, very good pleasure to actually meet the man and give him a fist bump. And he presented me with a mysterious black bag. And this might seem uh, staged, but I am legit looking inside this bag for the first time right here, right now. Even though it's open and I had ample opportunity to check out the contents, I never did. I never did. Except, of course, for the shirt that fell out. I resisted temptation. I kept my eyes shut. Now I'm going to open them and open the bag. I'm going to blindly reach in because I trust you, Chris. I trust there's not a bear trap or a, a trick buzzer in here, that there probably is something in here that I need to see, need to know, need to read. Okay, first of all, what do we got here? Okay, an Iconicide propaganda pamphlet all about the first 35 years of Iconicide. Now that's a thing. Anti-Scene celebrated our 40th recently. And here's Iconicide celebrating their 35th, you know? Coming up in the rock and roll era that I did, no bands had been around for 35 years. Not the Beatles, not the Grateful Dead, not the Stones. Nobody had been around for 35 years. And yet here we go, Iconicide, Lower East Side, New York punk hardcore, they have now been around for 35 years. How cool is that? And here's a genuine propaganda leaflet telling their story. Thank you, Chris. I will check that out. What else do we got? We have a CD. Uh -huh, how appropriate. An Iconicide CD called Engine of the Apocalypse. And this has got a lot of damn songs on it. Very cool. This will be good on my next long drive to North Carolina. Because I have a CD player in the vehicle and I got to listen to something. And this is something to listen to. Let me reach over and click the refresh button on my browser just to make sure I am still live. I think I am, but you got to double check, you know. Got to be sure about these things. Okay, I am. What else have we got here? One Iconicide sticker, which will be going on my distro box. And oh, more Iconicide stickers. Stickers are such a great form of communication. This is how you get the word out. You put the stickers around, people see them. And they say, hey, what's this Iconicide? I say, well, let me tell you about Iconicide. Dig it. All for the distro box. Oh, there you go. The other great punk rock form of communication, the button. Mike Lesser says, social distortion might have my 30 plus. Uh, Mike, I know you mean well, but 
I hate social distortion with a passion that rages and verges on the irrational. So let's not use the SD word ever again. Please, thank you very much. Maybe I'll tell the story of that sometime. Maybe I already have. I don't know. Fridge magnet? Yes. See, Chris knows how to get the word out on the absolute DIY level. Ooh, and a fancy pin. Look at that. Now that's a fancy pin. That's very cool. Brian Russell from Virginia chimes in and says, yes, please do not use the SD word. And then we got a quorum here, and that's good. Uh, let's see. Alan wants to hear the story. Sean Mosher heard the story. I will tell the story. Does not hear, does not now. It's kind of a long one, and we've already got a certain path we're going to follow. Pissy Chrissy wants to hear it. Oh, boy. Everybody wants to hear why I hate social distortion so much. Oh, my God. <clears throat> Put it on the list. Maybe next week, if I get enough reminders, because all of you people, if you know me well, you know, I need my reminders. If I get enough reminders, I'm capable of almost anything. So, as of right now, let's see if a flurry, if anybody wants to hear social distortion hatred stories. You got some thumbs ups, got some hatred smiley faces, whatever they are. Got some flaming, burning emojis. Oh, God, look at that. They're all pouring in. Everybody wants to hear about why I hate social distortion so much. Wow, okay. Uh, T. Kadef, in terms of using SD words, wants to know how I feel about Scooby-Doo. Um, loved Scooby-Doo. I watched Scooby-Doo every Saturday morning when I was a kid. So Scooby-Doo definitely is... 465,000 times better than that bland, generic, wishy-washy, pale, fake-ass corporate, I heard one Johnny Cash record and now I am a country punker brand of fucking bullshit music product that Social Distortion is. And I didn't even tell the story. You can see why it's probably going to take a solid episode of Tent Talks Tunes to get deep into the guts of the filthy matter of the absolute trite mediocrity of social distortion. Whew. I'd rather talk about Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band. Last week, I did a little bit of a show and tell on this very album relating to how Sometimes a band will release their second album and it's at least as good as or better than their first album. Everybody has heard about the sophomore jinx when a band releases a super killer debut. <coughs> Excuse me. But the follow-up doesn't quite measure up. Well, this is a case where I think that Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band's second album is better than the first. And since I talked about it, you know, I, I got into my kind of research mode and was reading up on it. I discovered that what I always thought was the Stone Cold original first pressing of this album was in truth not the first pressing of this album. So all of you people out there who are not serious hardcore record collector geeks, this is a good time to go get a snack from the fridge or check your email or send a text to somebody because I'm going to talk about how I never, ever knew that there was a first pressing of this album that I was unaware of. And the reason why that's really kind of important is because every version of this album that I'd ever heard suffers from, from, from some really bad mastering. And if any of you guys out there own your typical copy of Strictly Personal by Captain Beefheart, you know what I'm talking about. The common version has no lows, no highs, and everything in the middle just sounds compressed to the max. It is a super flat and dull sounding record. Like even if you crank the bass up all the way and crank the treble up all the way, or if you have a graphic equalizer and you try to get a nice curve on it, it still sounds very flat and very lifeless. And that was always sort of part of the legend of the album. 
besides the production with the psychedelic sound effects all over it, the mastering was just terrible. And I recently learned, and hopefully we can see this on the camera, that it, the early versions of this album, and I talked about this last week, have a black label. The common version has a tan label. And I always thought that the black label was the first pressing. Turns out that the absolutely original bona fide first pressing, and I think you can see this, has song separation between the tracks. Each track is banded. You can see where there's a space between every song. The common version that sounds crappy is just one long track. There's no song separation. Turns out that the first pressing actually was mastered properly and sounds great. Like it sounds good. It's rich. It's dynamic. It's got the bass. It's got the treble. It sounds the way it's supposed to sound. And there are reissue versions of this that came out in the UK around the same time. And a, there was a CD reissue of it that sounded good. But by criminy, the actual bona fide first pressing sounds the way it was always supposed to sound. It's fantastic. It's a great listening experience. And I just randomly found this at a local record shop over in Bethel, Connecticut called Disc and Dat. Like only a couple days after learning about it. So the universe works in mysterious ways. Without ever even knowing about it, a couple days after learning about it, I found one the next town over and at a very reasonable price. So I've already played this like almost on a daily basis since I got it. And it's a total revelatory experience to hear strictly personal the way it was supposed to sound originally. Yes, the joys of record collecting. I'll drink to that. I've also often maintained that that album, Strictly Personal, is if you're going to try to play Captain Beefheart to someone for the first time, that's one of the records you want to play. Like trying to start them off with Chop Mask Replica or Lick My Decals Off Baby or um, Ice Cream for Crow. Woo, you're asking for trouble. And there are other records that are maybe a little more commercial or, you know, but that's like along with Doc at the Radar Station, I think the perfect hybrid of avant-garde and listenability. Strictly personal. Love that record. Love it. And in the middle of all that, we haven't checked the bulletin board yet, but the bulletin board has just a couple of items on it. Anti-Scene coming up. We're playing live. We're an American band. We're coming to your town. We're going to help you get Destructoed down. Look at this slate of shows. We're playing April 4th at the Underground Arts in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Opening for Eat the Turnbuckles, Final Apocalyptic Bloodbath. Enough said. The next night, we're playing at the West Side Bowl in Youngstown, Ohio. The night after that, at the Skid Row Garage in York, Pennsylvania. We got a set list cooked up featuring favorites from our brand new album, Great Disasters, plus all the golden hits you would expect to hear from Anti-Scene. We are totally going to put the butter on your bread. April 4th, 5th, and 6th. And then for people in another part of the country, check it out. Just announced dates, May 8th. At the Star Bar in Atlanta, GA. May 9th at the Cherry Street Tavern in Chattanooga, Tennessee. May 10th at Reggie's in Wilmington, one of our favorite places to play. We love Reggie's. And May 11th at the Tap Yard in Raleigh, North Carolina. So there you go. Seven, count them, seven, seven, opportunities to see anti-scene in the near future. And that ain't all. We got more, more, more. How do you like it? Stay tuned for details as they bubble to the surface. 
Once again, I gotta reach over, hit the refresh button, make sure I'm still alive, because I don't know if I'm alive, blah, 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 blah. I've had problems with this before, trying to forestall any problems. All right, we're on, we're live, all's good. Eight tracks. Eight tracks are arguably the coolest format ever invented. I love my vinyl. I am extremely fond of cassettes. I'm a big advocate of reel-to-reel -reel tape. I am a newfound convert to CDs. But there's just something about eight tracks. Something about eight tracks that are really cool. I think it's because they harken back to a very specific time and very specific place that I'm quite nostalgic about. I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again. Growing up in suburban South Florida in the 60s and 70s, um, your average Florida house had what they called a Florida room. It's like you had your living room, dining room, bedrooms, and then the Florida room, which I guess is like the southern equivalent of a rumpus room or a man cave. We called them Florida rooms. And the Florida room, when I grew up, is where... Um, our neighbors from the next block over had their kind of like psychedelic den set up. I remember it was very dark. There were colored lights. There was the incredible psychedelic light box, which was really just a wooden box with a prismatic plastic lens on the front and a bunch of flashing Christmas lights on the inside. That was state-of-the-art technology back then. But my neighbors had one of them. They had the black light posters. They had a bar, which had liquor. Oh, that was incredible stuff. Um, they might have, might have even been burning incense. Who knows? But they also had a stereo, and part of the stereo system, along with the giant size speakers, was, of course, an 8-track play. And I remember to this day being a very young kid, mesmerized by the sight of this 8-track thing being shoved into the player and just kind of sticking out and playing the hits of the day, which I remember Three Dog Night, Janis Joplin, Steppenwolf, B.B. Uh, King, The Who... Like, between my old man and the neighbors, they had some pretty good taste in the contemporary hits of the day. And I always loved 8-tracks. And in fact, when I was in, I believe, the ninth grade, 8-tracks, this was like 1979, 8-tracks were on the way out. They were being phased out of the market. And around that time, the cutout bins were bursting with discontinued 8-tracks. You could get them for usually about a buck each. Occasionally more, sometimes less. And so for my birthday one year, I asked for an 8-track player. And lo and behold, I got one from Radio Shack. That meant that I could now go to the cutout bins in all the local department stores and music stores and buy all these discontinued 8-tracks for a buck each, as opposed to their vinyl equivalents, which were running six ninety nine dollars each. I mean, you can do the math, right? One dollar is a lot less than seven dollars. So I was having the time of my life getting these eight tracks, man. All at about a buck a throw. And in fact, let me look here. I've got one, two, three giant stacks of eight tracks precariously piled. Let me see if I've got any here that I actually did own for a buck each back in the day. Let's see. Well, this one's kind of close. I didn't actually have this one. Oh, actually, I did. David Bowie. Stage. Got it for a dollar. One dollar on eight track. This was a double LP. It was $8.99 on vinyl. I got it for a buck on eight track. Let's see. What else? I don't know if any of these I actually owned on eight track. No... See, this is live. This is the way we do it on live internet streaming. 
Okay, that's the only one in this pile that I actually owned. But you get the idea. It was possible to get some really, really cool titles really cheap on 8-track. And that just kind of ignited my love for the medium. You know, on top of my original childhood memories. So that coincided with the New Wave era. And just finding stuff like this, the police, Regatta de Blanc on 8-track. This is a real clash of the worlds because, you know, eight tracks are associated with Camaros and Trans Ams and the type of people who typically drive them, which meant they were listening to Yes, Black Sabbath, Van Halen. New Wave was not the kind of music you would typically find in the eight track player of someone like this, which is why it's so cool to have these titles, these albums on eight track because they really don't mix. How about this, The Clash, Combat Rock on 8-Track. That's pretty cool. This is coming in like the very late era of 8-Tracks. This one's pretty rare. What else have we got? Oh, I just showed it to you a second ago. B-52's second album on 8-Track. How cool is that? Which I took the liberty of packaging in a vintage 1970s generic 8-Track sleeve. I just love the crudeness of these graphics. All two-dimensional, quite possibly laid out by hand. No real art to it, strictly functional, but it looks great. This is a this is a look that cannot be replicated or duplicated. I don't care how good you are with Photoshop. This is the real deal. I love this. Here's another one. You want to talk about wonderfully cheesy graphics you, you would find almost exclusively on 8-track? How about this? Here's a Dynapack blank 8-track sleeve. Dig them psychedelic dancing girl graphics. Whoa, what lurid colors. What incredible mind-bending artwork. All drawn by hand. Love it. Just love it. And what's inside this generic sleeve? Oh, this is something. How about this? If I can get it out without destroying the sleeve. Once again, we're live, kids. This is how we do it live. Oh, if I can get it out. It's pretty tight in there. All right, here we go. I've talked about this before, and my love for the medium never abates. It's happening. It's happening. It's coming out. You guys are going to see it. I'm not going to admit defeat just yet. I've, I've, I've made it this far. Fudge sickles. This thing doesn't want to come out. I promise, guys, this is worth the wait. I think it's worth the wait. I totally think this is worth the wait. Mm. Dang. thought these things were form-fitting. Andy Miller from the great Knowledge is for Fools from Raleigh, North Carolina, digs the design. Andy Miller, are you guys playing with us, either in Raleigh or in Wilmington? I want to know, because Knowledge is for Fools kicks ass in all the right ways. Andy Miller is probably, actually I will say definitively one of only two people who ever got away with smashing a record over my head. Not only did he get away with it, I enjoyed it. So, what's up, Andy? Do you know yet? My inquiring mind wants to know. Anyway, after that long-ass struggle to get this, this uh, eight-track out of the sleeve, I am happy to reveal a generic Village People eight-track. Yes, this is in the style of Village People. It's not really the Village People. It's a bunch of faceless studio hacks cranking out cheap versions of Village People songs with the requisite completely irrelevant and poorly thought out, thought, poorly thought out cover art. I don't, I don't even know what that is. Maybe it's supposed to be a V? I don't know. But you couple all this together and you get a wonderful, a wonderful package. Andy Miller says, see ya in Raleigh. All right, that's good news. That takes a strong bill and makes it even stronger. Oh, man. 
this is a really weird one I've had forever. I, I've never gotten around to cracking this one open, but Your Man is Home Tonight by Tony Troutman. I guess he came home from work and he's shaking, wife, shaking hands with his wife. There's an entire album devoted to this, and it's uh, about as generic as you can possibly get. Never seen it on vinyl. Eight track only. Someday, I will crack this open and listen to it. Or maybe not. Here's another great, great, utterly generic cash in eight track The Sounds of Gordon Lightfoot. You could find these at truck stops and dime stores and flea markets all over the place back in the day, like $1.99 each. This one's got some good disclaimers on it. If I could read this one on the back, GNT was the manufacturer of this, and they took, took a lot of pain to put this sticker on the back of it, saying that no relationship of any kind exists between GNT and the original recording company nor between this recording and the original recording artist. This tape is not produced under a license of any kind from the original recording company, nor the recording artists, and neither the original company nor artists receives a fee or royalty of any kind from GNT. Ugh. Permission to produce this tape has not been uh, sought nor obtained from any party whatsoever. In other words, F you. We made it anyway. And I guess, actually, I guess this is, um, I'm going to guess that this actually is a straight pirate of the Gordon Lightfoot album. And they very unrepentantly say they did it without any permission whatsoever. That's pretty blatant. I guess if you're going to be a pirate, go all the way. I've never seen a disclaimer like that on any 8-track ever. Whew! I'm getting kind of, kind of getting my hackles up just reading that. Speaking of New Wave, here's Patti Smith on 8-track. Once Upon a Time property of Ms. Lori Dan. Lori, if you're wondering where your 8-track is, it's right here. But it's mine now. Sorry. Ah, here's another great pairing. For quite a while, uh, Capitol Records had a brand of record of a blank 8-track that they called the Beautiful Series. And here's one of them. Yes, for some reason, the Beautiful Series all featured uh, produce rendered in a very gentle hippie style. And as you can see, this one's a potato. A beautiful potato. A beautiful hippie potato that adorns a blank 8-track tape. Man, it's beautiful. And I don't have a beautiful 8-track, but I do have yet another completely generic slash flea market version of uh, Led Zeppelin Houses of the Holy. Very tastefully packaged with a soul sister on the front. If anybody wondered if Led Zeppelin's got soul, then perhaps this 8-track will answer the question. And check out that DIY graphic style on the back. No doubt mastered straight off of the scratchy vinyl and available at one time at a chup, at a what? A cheap truck stop near you. Tell me that's not cover art that is just dying to be repurposed along with the beautiful potato. I'm just throwing these ideas out there. Now here's one. This is like a real music geek thing. The original 8-track cartridge of the very first version of Billy Joel's Cold Spring Harbor. This was a very contentious album when it first came out. It came out on an independent label called Family Productions, which was uh, Billy Joel's 
production company for a very long time. Before he was signed to Columbia, this album came out independently on Family, and it apparently suffered from a bad mix and bad mastering, kind of like that Beefheart record, and was pulled from the market very soon after it first came out. And after Billy Joel got huge, it was counterfeited widely. You could find counterfeits of the LP and cutout bins all over the place, but the 8-track, to the best of my knowledge, was never counterfeited or reissued. So having this original first version of the long-lost, long-withdrawn original Billy Joel record on 8-track, that's pretty cool. I don't even like Billy Joel that much. It's just cool. Speaking of Bowie, how about a sealed copy of Bowie's atmospheric masterpiece, Low. This is probably my favorite studio album by Bowie. Fresh, sealed, original. And as is so often the case, let me double check this one. Actually, this one doesn't appear. Oh, no, this one is cut. A few years back, somebody dumped truckloads and truckloads of RCA 8-tracks that were all cut out and I guess never even sold, and they're all noticeable by the telltale drill hole in the spine. Man, there's tons of RCAs. This is one of them, but this is far classier than most of them. Most of them I buy in big old job lots. I'll go onto eBay and I'll cruise for 8-track job lots of sealed tapes, and I'll usually buy them, you know, sometimes as much as a hundred at a time, really cheap. And, they all, and a lot of them are like this, Neil Sadaka. Some generic Neil Sadaka record from 1970-whatever. Still sealed. And so what I'll do is I'll go through these giant job lots of 8-tracks, all sealed, crack them open, put new splices on them, put new pads in them if I have to, bulk erase them with a bulk eraser, and then record over them to create confections such as Charles Manson on 8-track. Or classic Massachusetts pissed off political hardcore drop dead on 8-track. Or how about even my fabulous band Ultra Bunny on 8-track. You'll notice what a smooth operator I am. I'm very slick. I always manage to work in a plug for my label, TPOS. And the fact that you can get these eight tracks, these eight tracks on Discogs, primarily. You know you want them. So yeah, that's how I do it. I get these job lots of sealed eight tracks and most of them are just filler stuff designed to be recorded over. Because nobody wants a Neil Sadaka 8-track. Sorry, Neil, nobody wants your albums on 8-track. But typically people are at least somewhat curious about your 8-track turned into a Charles Manson 8-track. That's part of how I make my living. That's a part of how I pay for the cat food for Harry the Cat, who uncharacteristically has been asleep the entire time. He's not come in here to make a cameo yet. But rest assured, guys, Harry is in the house, sleeping peacefully. Anyway, I digress. When I'm going through these giant-sized job lots of 8-tracks I'm going to record over, I do occasionally find cool, sealed stuff, like David Bowie Lowe. Or how about Swamp Dog? Yes, the great Swamp Dog. Have you heard this story? If you people don't know Swamp Dog, I suggest you look into him. Great eccentric outsider songwriter. Maybe too smart, too clever, too neurotic to ever make it big, but he's big in my book. And I found a sealed 8-track of one of his great albums, which I am keeping, not recording over. No, 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 no. found a sealed Slade 8-track. This is a UK 8-track. In, in Europe and UK, 8-tracks um, never caught on as big as they did in the States, but you can still find them. 
uh, from my understanding, they were primarily marketed towards U.S. servicemen who were over there during the Cold War. They really weren't meant for domestic consumption. And they still made a pretty fair number of them. So here's a Slade one, factory sealed, without any packaging, oddly enough. Go figure. Oh, man. How about some more New Wave? How about Joe Jackson, Look Sharp? Timeless classic front cover, and it's got a back cover that's, uh, you know, a little bit different from the LP version. A lot of these eight tracks do have slightly or sometimes greatly modified cover art from the canonical vinyl versions. And here's an example, Beatles Abbey Road. You know, same cover art, but with the text all over the front. Maybe not the most fascinating variant ever, but it's a variant, and it's kind of cool. And I'm willing to bet that the, uh, yeah, the track listing also is in a different order from the vinyl. And that's something else that's kind of cool. You can listen to an album like this on 8-track and hear a different sequence of songs, which a lot of times make you, makes you rethink the music. It's very interesting to hear it like that. Here's something that's really cool. Los Johnny Jets. So this is some wild-ass Mexican rock and roll from the 60s. Los Johnny Jets a go, go I've got a really cool compilation of uh, wild Mexican garage rock from the 60s, and Los Johnny Jets figure prominently on it. This one's been around the block a few times. It's got a helpful sticker on the back saying that, yes, it was recorded in Mexico. Um, I haven't had the nerve to try to play this one yet. I, this one's probably going to need some refurbing, but what's on this one? Bajate de mi nube, por ti, fiebre, es lupe. Here's one, no tengo dinero. I can relate to that one. Todos queremos a lupe. What's up with this lupe? Bule bule. Ah, Susi Ku. I believe I've heard their version of Susi Ku. And it's a hot one. Mi gran amor serás. Deja de llorar. Deja de llorar. You just know this has got to be good. I just love wild 60s rock and roll, especially from other countries. One of these days, I'm going to get the gumption to try to play this, hopefully without destroying it. Los Johnny Jets. Mm mm mm. What is this? Here's a cool one. Pretty hard to find on vinyl in original pressings. Here it is on 8-track, The Yardbirds, Little Games. I believe it's not, if it's not their last album, it's one of their last albums. I'm also pretty sure it's the one with Jimmy Page on it. I'm not the world's biggest Yardbirds fan, but it's just like a really cool artifact. And it's got the helpful... Your, uh, the identifying ad on the back from the Westchester Tape Center. Westchester Stereotape Center. With outlets in, uh, I'm pretty sure, White Plains, Yonkers, Poughkeepsie, Westport, Connecticut, Stratford, Connecticut. That's a time and a place. Ah, here's another really good generic one. I love this generic one. This is Santana Volume 1. And it's got that great generic rock and roll graphic on the front. Look at those hippies rocking out. You can tell. That's a fair representation of the music on this tape. Now, unlike that Gordon Lightfoot one I showed you earlier, the disclaimer here says, uh, Notices of intention to use copyrighted material filed where necessary. All required statutory royalties paid. See, now these guys were not rebels. They were not pirates. They're playing it straight. They paid statutory royalties. Which was actually a very cleverly worded get out for manufacturing these things. It's a very long tale. I'm not going to get into it now because I'm just about out of time. But you can look it up. You can what? Look it up. Ah, E Pluribus Funk by Grand Funk Railroad. With a lion on it. Maybe they were all Leos. I don't know. That's a counterfeit to the max. Here's a real Grand Funk. 
also sealed that I got from a job like Good Singing, Good Playing, produced by Frank Zappa. This is a great album. One of Grand Funk's best studio albums. Love this album. Can play it anytime. Sounds awesome. Production on it is really weird, but it grows on you. Great album. And also their last. They, they basically broke up before the album was even finished. And as stated before, the songs are in a different order than the vinyl. So you can hear it with somewhat fresh ears. God, so many. I could just really go on and on and on, but I'll just show you one last one. Just to show you that it's not just the pirates and the cash-ins who do sleazy, cheesy, exploitative marketing. But anybody of a certain generation will remember Kiss Alive 2, packaged as a super deluxe double cartridge. It was also a double album and a double cassette. Got the black and white spines, you know, packaged in a super deluxe Casablanca sleeve. Why is it so cheesy and so sleazy? Because they sold the double cassette, double eight track set for double the price of a regular eight track or cassette when these could easily fit on one cartridge. This album does not have such a long playing time. You know, cassettes and eight tracks were made to have long playing times. I think each one of these clocks in at like 30 something minutes. I mean, come on. Would have been a cinch and a half to fit this onto a single cartridge. Or at bare minimum, spread some of the cover art out, you know, because it came with a booklet and a deluxe gatefold sleeve. Why make them both identical? Why not put, like, the front cover on one and some of the, you know, booklet content on the other? I mean, you do get this insert with a special offer on the reverse side to send away and pay for the booklet that came with the 8-tracks. You can do that, but he ain't giving you nothing for double the price. Having said that, okay, it's still a cool artifact. It's a neat thing to have. And you can also see by the telltale drill holes, this ended up in the cutout bins when Kiss Mania went bye-bye. And that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to say bye. So it's been a great, fun hour talking to you people about the mail and TPOS and one of the great lost formats that could crank out wonderful, generically packaged stuff like this. Love it. And I love having the chance to share it with all of you guys every week, whenever it is that I'm in town. So yeah, uh, looks like I will be in town next week. So Lord willing, the creeks don't rise. I'll see you guys in about 167 hours. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>